This is a poem called Lepra. <clears throat> it starts with a, uh, another epigraph. And this one is from a book called Jesus, a Revolutionary Biography by uh, the controversial um, early Christian, a scholar of early Christianity, uh, John Dominic Crossan. The leprous person is not a social threat because of medical contagion, threatening infection or epidemic, as we might imagine, but because of symbolic contamination, threatening in microcosm the very identity, integrity, and security of society at large. Your rash is theological, a havoc, a ravage, a scath, mephitic alloy, zymotic azoth, something alive, thus imperfect. Do you love me, Peter? Agape diluted into philo, so the psyche can apprehend it. Is devotion a blemish? Humors are juice, not excrement, a fluid, fluent part of the body comprehended in it. Unpurged ghosts defidate the rescue of souls by God, by loving women and men. Anthropos and pneumati e catharto. Leprosy is the soul in a cathartic suspension, your skin blistering with lesions. Legion, separations yellow in daylight. Cicatrization is flesh darning in loving kindness. I would lick your wounds until they sweetened sufficiently to tolerate interrogation. It's supine in attendances. Do you love me? I'm listening. Your recovery from this damage depends on this question. Let me, let me touch these exulcerations analogous to the thought necrosis of your melancholy. Let me mesh with you into an intersubjective epic of connection, dream. My care is an analeptic lenative, a loving prescription, a list of useful books. Healing is doctoring only in its glorification of the mind embodied. Life, nozo mnemonic to uneasiness, expresses a chylus of dread in the gut, a leucocytic syrup gagged forth in fits or diffused in a gas of mystery. You can only live in a cemetery out of fear of contact, which is need of contact. I don't even need to touch you to cure you. To be clean, take this love a wop at your feet. Touch it and with it, be touched. I've always found that really fascinating, this notion that leprosy, which is one of the diseases that shows up in the New Testament, it has this modern analog. You know, we think of it as, um, we think of it as leprosy, which is Hansen's disease, which comes from a bacteria. You know, it's, it's totally contagious, and that's why leper colonies were created. But, Leprosy, as it appears in, in the New Testament, this word lepra, had to do with like really bad rashes, really bad skin, skin problems, usually because people weren't clean enough, you know? Like if you don't wash regularly, you're going to get, your skin's going to get kind of nasty. And one of the things about Jewish law uh, was, was you couldn't have, you couldn't be oozing fluid, <laughs> and go into the temple to perform sacrifices. You had to be clean. You know? This is why all the menstrual prescriptions arose, uh, which you, know, you, you just have to read Leviticus, etc., to glory in those. Uh, but it's a kind of interesting thing that it shifted over into the New Testament in terms of the way that Christ, the story of Christ is told, but from these four different writers' perspectives. And each of them is interested in you know, you can, you can organize Christ's miracles into two, two basic groups. Uh, commensal eating, that is, he would eat with people he wasn't supposed to, or touching. He would touch people he wasn't supposed to, or people would touch him. Uh, so that's the sort of... Um, I, that, that seems in itself an interesting way to start thinking about what a miracle is, you know, having to do with receptivity having to do with, you know, contact, something like that. Um, 
I'm going to read for you now some selections from this, uh, the poem that I'm working on right now. This is a long poem called The Phosphorescence of Thought. Um, sometimes, uh, sometimes the poetry reading can be this thing where the poet reads and everybody, uh, everybody's expected to understand what he's talking about. And, and then the way typically that this is mediated in an event like this is I'm supposed to be uh, kind of ironic. And that's supposed to put you at ease in some way. But, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes into writing a poem that some of which I'm aware of and some of which I'm not. But it's kind of ridiculous for me to expect you to have any idea at any point what I'm talking about. Um, so then that puts me in the position of explaining some things and it's hard not to sound kind of pedantic in that situation. So I've been, I've been experimenting with this and I've been trying to, trying to find a kind of middle way, I guess. Um, how to explain certain things without going into a lecture and also how to just read things and allow you to uh, hopefully appreciate them for, uh, for what's there. So I'll give you just a couple of little bits of information and I give these to you because, you know, this is my, the, the sort of my investment in this material kind of arises from these things. Um, the title comes from uh, a phrase that appears in the works of the, the Jesuit paleontologist uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Um, that's a kind of strange label, uh, Jesuit paleontologist. He was... Um, he was a controversial figure when he was, uh, shortly after he died. While he was alive, nobody really knew about him because he took his vow of obedience to the Society of Jesus very seriously. And the authorities in the Society of Jesus would not allow him to publish his controversial theological writings. He was, it, his scientific writings were published you know, widely. He wrote a lot of papers. He was famous for discovering the Peking Man, which at the time was the oldest complete uh, humanoid skeleton. I think it was 300,000 years old or so. And he spent most of his adult life living in China or uh, the Gobi Desert, often you know, alone or with a few other Mongolian uh, yak herders or something like that. Um, in his what, probably his most important book is a thing called the, the Phenomenon of Man. That's usually how it's translated into English, but it could just as easily be the human phenomenon. And he had this idea that as humans were evolving through time, God was also evolving, and that th this coevolution was going to lead toward this omega point. That's the, the name he gave to it, in which he believed at that moment, humans and God would be completely identical. Uh, the whole universe would become Christ. He was, after all, Catholic. <laughs> um, but he also was a guy who was, was positing the very first you know, genuine theories of, of evolution in a Christian theological sense, not feeling that there was an antagonism. Um, 